child sexual abuse in this country is on the rise and i'm sure as parents there are a lot of questions anxieties queries that are topmost in your minds and you are confused as to how to handle them well i'm going to now talk about two aspects about child sexual abuse one how to prevent it and two if you are in doubt then what you should be doing first of all it's very important to understand that it's a myth that only poor children get sexually abused today the scenario in india and world over is that every child can be abused so let's talk about what to do so that your child does not become a victim of child sexual abuse children especially under the age of 5 are most susceptible to child sexual abuse why because children thrive on touch they want to be hugged they want to be kissed they want to be touched all over the body because brain thrives on touch and that's why child sexual abuse is rampant amongst children under the age of 5 so it's very important first and foremost that we teach our children about good touch and bad touch many parents ask me how do we do this to a child who's as young as 2 or as young as 3 well if children can be taught rhymes about uh, traffic signals how to cross the road safely i'm sure we can teach them in a simple way about what is good touch what is bad touch and what are the four parts of the body where nobody should be touching them except their mummies so it's very important to identify those four parts those four parts are your lips your chest the part between your legs it's very important to point to children you may be finding it odd that i'm pointing to these parts as i talk to you but it's very important that if we don't point to those parts children can get confused because you may be calling the part between the legs as vv and the child sexual abuser may call it something else and say i'm not touching you on your vv i'm touching you on something else so it's very important to point to those parts so let's look at those parts again your lips your chest the part between your legs and your bottoms so show and point these parts out to your children don't make it a very anxious moment when you are teaching this it can be done through uh, during bath time it can be done during bedtime any time when you are playing with the child just insert the good touch bad touch four parts and the child will understand over a period of time and it will be ingrained in your child your child will become subconsciously conscious that when somebody touches me here i'm not supposed to also it's not only important to teach them that don't get touched in these parts teach them that don't touch others in these parts you will be shocked to know that many child sexual abusers are making children touch them on their private parts so it's very important to point this out to children that these four parts are not to be touched on your body and you shouldn't touch somebody else on their body with it and then what to do so you're teaching your child that if anybody touches you in these parts you will say no and you will run to the nearest adult so a child knows by this that i have a choice i i can be safe so it's very very important a to teach about good touch bad touch b very important to know is your child unattended in at any time of the day predators watch children before they attempt child sexual abuse so they have watched your child's daily agenda is your child the last one to get out of the school bus is your child the first one to get into the school bus and then there's nobody so it's very important to monitor your child's daily activity to find out at what point is your child alone with adults and then make it a point to talk to those adults and warn them that i don't like my child to be touched in these body parts so they are aware about it they will hesitate to put your child in unsafe conditions because they know that you are aware about your rights and responsibilities so it's extremely important to look at who is supervising your child and is he unattended he or she is unattended during the day number 3 if you have babysitters if you have watchmen liftmen uh, drivers ayas looking after your child please get their police verification done and you have every right to approach the school or the daycare to ensure that they have got their staffs police verification done this is now a kind of a law a necessity please understand a lot of schools and areas will tell you we have cctv cameras but that's not going to deter 
a child sexual abuser. What's going to deter them is when they their records are with the nearest police station, they know they can't run anyway. So the most important thing is get a police verification done. And next, to prevent child sexual abuse in your child, talk to your child at the end of the day. Where did the child go? With who did the child play? What did they play? So you are able to understand that, oh, while he is waiting for the school bus, he, there is a watchman who plays with him. What does he play with him? So you are very clear about sharing with the child and making the child share with you that uh, this is what uh, the child did or this is what the child was playing. And then in that conversation, if you find something that you makes you uncomfortable, you can point it out to your child that, okay, you played this. Uh, mummy wouldn't play like that. So next time when this uncle plays with you like this, say no. And maybe if this continues, you can have a chat with that uncle. Make your family members, your close friends also aware about good touch, bad touch. They also should not be touching your child in these private places. It's a myth that only strangers abuse children. Sometimes it is a family member. In fact, in 70% of child abuse cases, it has been found that it is a very close family member or friend who has abused the child. So it's important that you share with your close friends and family that you believe in good touch, bad touch. And these are the four parts that you don't like your child to be touched on so that they are also aware of their limits to practice with your child. Very important, another two things that parents must keep in mind, what abusers use against your child. They ask your child to keep a secret and number two, they threaten your child. So if in your parenting practices, you use threatening as a discipline tool, then a child is conditioned to listen to threats. So avoid threatening your child because then strangers too can threaten your child. You as a parent, if you put the fear of threatening in your child, then strangers will use it against your child. It's difficult, but if you consciously practice it, you will realize that it leads to the safety of your child. Secrets. Commonly in our family, we'll tell a child, don't tell this to your dad or don't tell this to your grandmother, or a grandmother says, don't tell this to your mother, I'm giving you a chocolate. These are secrets. You're now taught your child that we can keep secrets from each other. And this is exactly what a child abuser uses against your child. He will tell your child a combination of a threat and a secret. You will not tell what I have done to your mother. Otherwise, I'm going to hurt you. So you saw, this is the combination of secret and threat that can be used against your child. So keep your child away from secrets and threats. Talk to your child how you don't like to be keeping secrets, that you should not keep any secrets from mummy. You must come and tell mummy everything. And that is why that bedtime routine becomes so important. You can share with your child that this happened in my office or this happened at home today and then make your child share with you. This will help your child open up. So it's very important that when we talk about prevention, prevention just doesn't stop at teaching children good touch, bad touch. In fact, it starts with good touch, bad touch. And then there are so many other elements which I talked about, which are part of the prevention process. If parents are just aware of it and practice it consciously, daily with their children, they have 90% chance of keeping their children safe from child sexual abuse. One of the most important factors today, which many experts feel is leading to more and more children being abused, is the presence of child pornography so easily available on mobile phones. So I would suggest to parents that if you have employed male servants, male drivers, or anybody who looks after your child who's male, Please make it very clear to them that you are against the use of this material on mobile phones. And if you doubt, regularly check their mobile phones. Because impulse control is low in males. And then when they watch this kind of content, they use or look for children who they can easily abuse. So it's a very important point to note in parents. I'm now going to talk to you about if you suspect that your child has been sexually abused, what should you do? First of all, it is something that starts with not believing the child. So never do that. If your child comes to you, seems withdrawn, seems agitated, 
is cranky all of a sudden, which is not your child's usual behavior, it's time to suspect that something is wrong. And if your child tells you that so-and-so uncle or so-and-so auntie has done this to me, your first reaction should be of believing the child. Never say, no, this could not have happened. Don't speak like that. That's rude or uh, that's insulting. Don't say these words. Your child is trying to open up about a very emotional experience that the child has had. So the first step would be accepting and believing in the child. Listen to the child, whatever the child is saying, and then don't interrupt when the child is talking because young children, when they are emotionally upset, can talk uh, in broken sentences. They can go on and on for 20 minutes. Let the child vent it out. Uh, in your mind, make a few points that you would like to revisit to help understand what exactly happened. Uh, if your child just says, so and so touched me and then withdraws, uh, you can use art therapy, which means give your child a piece of paper and crayons and say when you were playing with that uncle, can you draw and tell me what happened? You would be surprised when we have done this kind of therapy with even two-year-olds. We've had two-year-olds drawing a blob and a line. And when we asked what it is, they said, this is uncle and this is the park bench. And this is where uncle sat with me and touched me. So it's very important to understand that children have a hundred languages. Every child may not be comfortable talking. Some children may be more happy with drawing and showing their feelings. So be open to that. Uh, if your child, while you are bathing your child, if you see marks that you usually don't see on your child's body, especially in young baby girls, you will see a redness near the vagina. It means something is wrong. Uh, ask your child because it's not uh, uh, common for young children to have that kind of an infection in that particular body part. So that means maybe something has happened. Uh, important to take the child to the doctor to get more details about it. But most importantly, believe your child. I've had instances when parents come to me with these kind of cases and they say, how can a three-year-old be able to tell me? I, when we talk to the child, we are able to take out and then the parent is amazed and understands that, okay, when I listen and I talk, the child will tell me everything. Now, God forbid, you come to know that, yes, your child has been abused. What is the first thing that you should be doing? The first thing is don't put the blame on yourself or the child. Our first instinct when we are upset is, see, I told you not to, not to play with that uncle. Why did you play with that uncle? That shouldn't be your reaction because your child has already gone through a traumatic event, which maybe the child her, himself or herself doesn't realize was of trauma. But don't put the guilt. You will have to really resist the urge to ang be angry and point at blame. Second, please don't feel guilty. Many parents who come to me with child abuse cases extremely break down and feel guilty that maybe because we are working parents, this has happened to our child. It could have happened to your child even if you were there 24-7 with your child. It's, it's just bad luck that it happened. So don't blame yourself. Uh, move on. And the best way to move on is to A, talk to your child. If you feel your child is going through extreme emotional trauma, it's time to get in some counsellor to talk to your child. Uh, what's your plan now? Do you want to report it to the police? And here is where I find parents hesitating, that they are worried. If they report it to the police, and if the police catches the culprit, and if the police don't give the right justice, and if the culprit is back on the streets, will he take revenge on my child? Well, that is a fear nobody can answer. But think about the other side. You don't report this man or woman. And this man goes on and abuses 20 other children. And how are you sure this man will not tell the next servant that you keep that they are very scared, you can do this to their child, they won't do anything about it. So you have two fears to choose from. Choose the safety of your child. And I'm sure when you take this as a decision between husband and wife or as a family, whatever decision you feel is most comfortable and most in favor of your child, stick to that decision. 
you can report a child abuse case. India, I think, has the strongest law for child sexual abuse. POCSO is the strongest law. Read about it. Google search it. Your rights and responsibilities are clearly outlined in that law. If you have found out that your child is sexually abused, then you should, I would recommend you should file an FIR because these kind of perverts need to be brought to justice. Otherwise, we are not doing justice to our young children. So when you do file an FIR, please understand the law is very clear and very supportive of the child. First of all, you don't have to take the child to the police station. So you don't have to worry about that. The law clearly states a lady police officer in plain clothes has to come to your house and when your child is comfortable the all the questioning will start number two very very important that you follow up on the fir um, sometimes police may or may not take it seriously that's why it's important that you know the right ngos to approach because they handhold you throughout the whole process there are good NGOs uh, like Pratham who do help parents out and who have complete knowledge about the entire legal procedure to follow. So it's very important that A, you believe the child, B, you counsel the child and yourself if something like this has happened, C, know your rights and file an FIR and D, most importantly, many parents are afraid to file an FIR because the minute something reaches a police station, crime beat reporters come to know about it and you are afraid that your child's name is going to be splashed all over the media. This is where again the government's POCSO policy, the POCSO law, the act of child sexual abuse is very clear that media cannot in any way leak out your child's name, where your child lives, which school your child attends, anything that would give the indication of the child's identity. So if you know this right, you would know that you are secure and you are doing whatever you are doing like filing an FIR to ensure that the culprit is brought to justice. And it's very important that your child safety is then ensured because the people who work around you, the people who work with your child know that you would take such extreme steps for the safety of your child. If your child has been abused in the school, maybe by a teacher or a lady attendant or a male attendant or in the school bus, you should not shy away or be afraid of the school. You have to bring it to the notice of the school principal or the head of the school and go to the principal with relevant facts. How did you find out? What made you suspect that the child has been abused? And then the principal or head of the school has to conduct a fair inquiry in which you have to be in the loop of the entire inquiry process to understand exactly what inquiry the school has done to find out. I would also say that the school should suspend that staff member till the inquiry is in process. You should demand for that because your child is going to feel unsafe in school till that staff member is around. So the first thing that schools should do as per law is to believe when a parent comes to them and take action like suspending the staff pending inquiry, conduct the inquiry, keep you in the loop of that inquiry. And yes, usually the police say that the FIR has to be filed by the parent. But if it has happened in school, the school should be part of the FIR process. So they have to stand by you and help you do that. I would in fact urge all school owners, school heads and school principals that when a parent approaches you and says that uh, I feel one of your staff has abused my child, uh, you should in fact give a reassurance to this parent that if something like this has happened, we are with you 100%. Most schools are afraid of negative publicity and that's why they shy away. Their first reaction is, no, nothing like this can happen in my school. He's a trusted staff member. No. Remember, when you stand by that parent, all the other parents' trust in you increases. In fact, they feel if the school is so careful, so trustworthy about our child's views or what has happened to our child, then this is the best school.